So hello and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today to learn about how we can um, help our children develop successful study skills at home. I'm Maggie Kilman. I'm the Lifelong Learning Manager here at the Cincinnati and Hamilton County Public Library. I'm so pleased that you all could be here with us tonight um, for this program. I wanna go over just a few quick housekeeping reminders before I turn it over to our presenters. Uh, one, please be sure to keep yourself on mute unless you are speaking. Um, if you aren't sure how to, feel free to just uh, shoot me a message in chat and I can help you out behind the scenes. Uh, feel free to post questions and reactions in our chat box as we go along. Uh, this program is intended to foster conversation and um, help you guys get the answers that you need in order to start the school year successfully. At the end of um, the session, or after the session, I will send out a recording to everyone who is registered, as well as a follow-up survey. So please, if you have a few moments, um, take just a couple of minutes to fill out the survey and give us your feedback. We really appreciate it, and it really helps us as we uh, work to plan better programs for you that meet your needs going forward. Uh, and then one last reminder, so everyone knows the session is being recorded and will be posted publicly on the library's YouTube channel after the fact. Um, but your personal names will not be included in the recording. So um, we are all safe there. So without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to our presenters today. We have from the Huntington Learning Centers located here in Cincinnati, Stephanie Hardewig and Raquel Diaz Infante. Um, yes, and I will hand it over to y'all and let you uh, take it from here. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Hopefully we can provide you with some solid, useful information. So today we're going to be talking about successful study skills at home. Uh, the agenda for today is how parents can help their children prepare for the new school year. So we're going to be discussing back to school tips, back to school tips in a COVID-19 school year, tips for making the school year great no matter the setup, study skills, learning tools, and then answer any questions that you may have at the end. So the first tip that we are going to be discussing is adjusting the schedule. So adjusting the schedule. So since March, your children have been on a totally different schedule, sleeping in, staying up late, and you probably, they probably been rolling with it just because they've had other things to focus on. But it's time to get back into that school mode because some of your children might be going back in person and others might be doing remote or hybrid um, for, for learning this fall. And it is definitely going to be much more structured and intensive than it was in the spring when it comes to the curriculum that they had. Um, you know, unfortunately the teachers and school administration had no notice, so they were not prepared to go virtual. So what can we do? Um, the first thing that we suggest is move back bedtime. So a little bit each night over the next, you know, one to two weeks before the first day of school. Uh, parents with teens, you know, we totally understand you're not tucking your children in every night. Um, some general rules and expectations for acceptable lights out and wake up times and phone shut off times. Um, the second tip is start setting the alarm clock the last week or even two weeks of summer, have them start setting an alarm to begin the day closer to the time of a regular school day. So that way they can adjust, you know, steadily versus just kind of being thrown into a new schedule. And then establish chores again. If you've, you've kind of let them lapse a bit, um, I, I know that, that I have, it does help to give days with some structure and rebuild some sense of daily responsibility for them. And then establish a regular dinner time, um, which also gives the days, you know, a little bit more structure and a little bit more routine. And lastly, get your child back into a nightly reading routine. 
So it can be anywhere between 20 and 45 minutes, ideally before bed. It's a great way to get them learning again while also resuming some semblance of a routine. And then tip number two, reflect on last year. It's important to spend a little time reflecting together on last year, lessons learned, and how to apply those lessons to this year. I know that it was a huge shock to everyone when the children went remote. You know, parents were, were not really sure, you know, how to operate, you know, Google Classroom, where to get assignments. So we encourage you uh, to sit with your children and to talk about how school is going um, to preschool closure. So what was going well? Did your children feel more confident last year? Did they start to enjoy some subjects more or become stronger test takers? Were they more confident? Were they engaged? Were they motivated? Talk about the subjects that became more difficult after school closed. We all know that remote learning did not work for everyone. You might wanna tread a little bit lightly here. Um, it might not be your children's favorite subject to talk about um, or talk about a particular part of school um, just because you know, it caused a lot of stress last year. So if it isn't already addressed by um, the above two things that we just talked about, make sure you ask your children about their academic strengths and weaknesses especially after the closures. Where did your children struggle? What subjects are strong for your children and generally have been? I know a lot of parents um, you know, said, you know, my, my student usually does excellent in reading or excellent in math. And when we went online, there was no structure. Classes weren't being taught or they were putting them in online programs or they stopped the learning you know, just in general and maybe worked on some skills that they had previously worked on in the year. Last but not least, talk to your children about some of the fundamental habits they need to improve upon to be more successful in school this year. So is there room for improvement in study habits, organ organizational skills, time management skills, and stress management? Um, stress management is huge. Um, and I know a lot of parents are, are under a lot of pressure right now. You may be working from home, or now you might be forced to work from home because your children are at home. And it's very hard, you know, for you to manage their schedules and your schedules. Um, so some reflection on last year can help get your children thinking ahead about how to tackle challenges this school year. So tip number three, have your children set goals. After some reflection, goal setting is so important. It gets children thinking about the future and planning ahead. So we're gonna go through a few tips on how to approach that. So while long-term go goals are awesome to have, we wanna really focus on short-term goals on this particular slide. So the first is have your children think about goals for school this year, or even start with the next few months. An example of that might include improving a grade or becoming a stronger reader. And now you wanna break those goals down into steps. For example, using the goal of becoming a better reader, how about breaking that into a smaller step of reading 25 minutes a day for five or six days a week. It's measurable and achievable, yet, you're, you're, yet you will help your child reach that bigger goal by doing that. And then your child should also acknowledge and identify possible roadblocks. Reading 25 minutes a day sounds great, but what is preventing your child from doing this? You know, a child who wants to become a better reader this year finds reading frustrating. Um, an example of a goal and corresponding roadblock. So maybe the child hasn't found books that fit his or her ability or interest, and that's extremely important. I always tell parents that come into the center, as long as it's great appropriate, it could be a sports magazine, it could be a comic book. Um, you know, you want to have your children reading things that interest them. We call that pleasure reading. And the more that your child reads for pleasure, the less problems they will have reading academically. So 
definitely look at ability and interest when you're picking reading material with your children. And if I can make a quick plug, call your local library if you need help finding the best fit for Absolutely. your child. Absolutely, I think that's wonderful. <laughs> And then lastly, your child should figure out how to work around the roadblocks. The most obvious is to dig into the problem and get help you know, from a teacher. Um, as far as finding good books, as Maggie just said, reach out to the library. Um, you know, The library is just a wealth of information and they have many books that we would never even think about. Um, and then maybe the teacher can help you with workarounds um, you know, as far as book recommendations, and librarians are an excellent resource for this. So your your children should definitely use them. So when school begins, your your children can keep resisting their goals, but the exercise now can get your children into a school mode and set the tone for a positive start to the school year. So let's talk about some back to school tips in a COVID-19 school year. So tip number, tip number one, make sure you have the right technology. As you've learned in the spring when school shut down, remote learning without technology in place is not ideal. So here's what your students need. And of course your school might have additional guidelines. So obviously a computer or Chromebook, if that's what your, your school uses, a laptop or a PC. Um, if the laptop or Chromebook does not have a webcam, you're definitely gonna need a webcam for, for that instruction. Internet connection and access to apps that teachers request. So every, which makes this even harder for parents out there, every teacher uses different tools and resources. So you won't need to get this ready until you're into the school year, but just as an FYI, you're probably gonna have multiple websites that you're utilizing if you're doing remote learning. Um, my recommendation is to get a password list started and have that posted somewhere, the website and then the password, username and the password for each one so the student has that readily available if needed. So, and here are a few things that aren't required but are kind of nice to have. If you have a separate monitor with speakers, then they can look at dual, dual monitors. If they're a high school student, I do not recommend this for elementary school students. Um, it'll kind of take them off task, but a high school student can be looking at the teacher and then looking at the curriculum at the same time. That is very useful. Um, long hours on a small laptop screen can also be very hard on our children's delicate eyes. Um, a separate mouse for easier navigating. Um, same thing here. If you've been working at home, you know that a touchpad for hours a day isn't ideal and a mouse just works so much easier. I highly recommend noise canceling headphones. This can be helpful for multiple students learning from home and it's also helpful to parents because if you're working and you're busy on a conference call or you're trying to concentrate, you don't want to hear everything that's going on, you know, in the classroom, especially if it's a high schooler. Um, they're set up to, to be able to work independently. And then a printer. It may not be essential, but boy, is it useful. Um, a lot of times our children, and this is what we recommend with the younger children, if they have assignments to, to print them out and have them do them by hand, and then go back in and plug in their answers. It takes them off of the screen, and then it also gives them that mental imprint of seeing it, touching it, and then obviously reading it or whatever they might be doing with a piece of curriculum. The next tip is to get your home set up for remote learning. If spring remote learning was pretty much your kids sprawled on the living room floor or hogging the kitchen counter, um, and maybe you had to share laptops among your kids, um, you know that that was not an ideal situation and probably caused a little bit of havoc. So now we have a little bit of time, um, you know, in the next three weeks, schools, pretty much all schools in our area will be starting. So anything you can do that can make that remote learning better, a better experience for, for your children and obviously for you, um, you know, would, would be the best thing to do. So the first step in that is to re refresh, refresh supplies. 
I'm talking about usual things, pencils, markers, paper, calculator, et cetera, the things that they need that you would get them if they were going in school. Make sure you're ready at home and equipped with all these things, both for school, if your child's school is doing in-person learning and at home. And then make sure your children have a dedicated space for learning. Children need a, a space to learn and study at home, whether it's a spare bedroom turned into a study or desk in bedrooms or another setup. And you wanna make that space as school-like as possible. So you wanna kind of think like your child's teacher in this particular case, um, what would make that learning space more productive or cozy or inspiring. So, you know, a couch is probably not the best space. A dining room table is good. Kitchens can be, you know, everybody's walking into the kitchen to get a drink or a snack or it's time to make lunch or dinner. It can be very chaotic in the kitchen and we highly recommend not using the kitchen if you have other work areas. And if, you're, if your child is using their room, you wanna make sure that, you know, during their, during their academic time that they don't have, you know, they can have light music in the background, but not access to the TV or cell phone, um, you know, just as like what they would have in school. And then you also wanna hang a school day schedule. Once you know what your children's school setup will look like, hang a daily schedule around your children's desk that lay out each day. Make it detailed enough to keep your children on track all day. Incorporate breaks and meals and fluid enough that the children can have some kind of flexibility in that schedule. You know, our elementary school children, they have recesses and they have gym class. We, you know, I highly recommend um, that they have that time. Go outside and take a walk. You know, a 20 minute break to take a walk or to ride your bike around the neighborhood. You know, those, that would be considered, you know, the recess or a gym class. And then consider accommodations for different needs. Parents with children who have ADHD, think about desk placement, just like your children's teachers would. Facing the window is probably not the best place. It encourages daydreaming. So where might it better fit in your house? Perhaps one of your children likes working with a little noise such as music, while your other child prefers a quiet working area and wants to work alone. So how can you outfit your space to work for both? So think critically about your home learning space and whether it's ideal for your children. The next thing I'd like to talk about is empowering your children. Whether going online or in person or some combination, we all want our children to be successful. So we've listed some general tips um, for elementary, middle, and high school students. Take a look and see what you can glean. Bottom line here is that so much of school success being independent as a learner is number one, being organized is number two, Working hard is number three, and four is embracing a can-do and can-learn attitude. So if you teach your children these things, they're, you know, they're a big step ahead of most students. So again, you know, really encouraging, you know, that independence of working, um, teaching your children to have great attitudes, teaching them those management skills, um, and then establishing those strong organizational skills and study habits. So doing work at home. So once you prepared your child um, and your school has communicated the expectations and directions to you, you can get your child started. So obviously we wanna set those expectations, set a daily schedule, Partner with your child's teacher. It's very important that you have a relationship with your teacher, um, which I'm sure all of you you have in the past with their with with their previous teachers. But now more than ever to have that communication. Um, as we indicated in the beginning of the presentation, online learning can be very difficult for children. Um, you know, and children that need that little extra that little extra support you know, that teacher's not right there next to them. And then there's the social aspect of this as well. I mean, our children are stressed out over COVID. 
I know I am, um, but for them, you know, that whole social aspect has really gone out the window for them. And, you know, that's one of the things that kids really love to go to school. They love to see their friends. They love their teachers. They love to have recess and gym class, and they're missing those things. Um, so you really want to have that open communication with the teacher, especially if your child is struggling and how you can get them extra support. You want to make sure that you read all the instructions from the school because like I said, they're probably going to have multiple websites and it's very important that you have everything that you need to help your child be successful. And if you don't understand something, immediately reach out to the teacher. Um, I think they're, they're getting pretty prepared, all the teachers that I have here. Um, you know, obviously they have full-time jobs during the day at, at our local schools. And, you know, they're preparing certain times to, to meet with parents via Zoom um, and have those independent conversations. And lastly, all of us, you know, just staying healthy. So the next slide I, that we put together for you guys is just a sample schedule. So as, as I said before, routine is so important, um, but it will become critical during this time of doing remote learning. So here's an example of what an at-home schedule might look like. And if you are working at home, be sure to create a schedule and share it with your children too. So they understand um, that you're working from, you know, they're working from home and so are you. So, you know, there has to be times where they're gonna be able to come to you if they have a question, but they need to understand that you're on a schedule as well. And, you know, just, just that mutual respect there. Are there any questions over the tips to going back to school before we get into study skills? Maggie, are we, are we good to move forward? I think so, I don't see any. Um, I will say that so many of the points you've been hitting are actually things that we've had other speakers address, like the um, helping your kid cope with stress. Um, we had a presentation yesterday. There was one about how to have great relationships with teachers on Monday. So I encourage everybody, if you weren't able to join us for those sessions, watch out for the recordings that I send out because we've got even more tools to help you guys get set up. That's wonderful. And those are all such, such wonderful things. Yeah. We did have one question just come in. Um, how do we get a first grader to follow a schedule at home? Okay. Um, well, if you kind of look at the sample schedule here, you know, obviously the, like we said, bedtime, I'm sure you already have a set bedtime, a certain time to wake up, a certain time to have breakfast. You know, with a child that young, I would incorporate intermittent breaks all throughout the day. Um, as, as any of us that have children know that when you have a first grader, you know, whether they're six or they're seven, um, they, they can't sit for two hours and, and just sit and learn. So you're going to have to incorporate, you know, 10 minute breaks or 15 minute breaks. You know, maybe they work for, maybe they work on one assignment or let's say math is from 10 to 11, however your school schedule will go. And then instead of going right into the work that's assigned, they get a 15 or a 20 minute break. And then, then they do that homework or they're moving on to their, their next online class and you break that up. Because I do understand it's, it's, it's really hard when you have young children, how do you get them on a set schedule? But it would be the same as the sample schedule here. I would just add intermittent breaks in between their classes and in their homework time. Did that answer your question? Um, there's one more question. They say, yes, it helped. One more question has come in. Last year, my nine-year-old was suddenly shy about participating via online with the teacher to the point that he was emotional. Suggestions? So, and you're not the first parent that I have heard that from. So I, I feel like last year with, with students, especially at that age, so anywhere between second and sixth grade, there were probably a lot of students, um, you know, making fun of other kids, you know, if they ask what they felt was a silly question. The one thing that I would do if, if your child is hesitant to ask questions, have your child write the question down, 
and either use the chat function to ask the teacher privately or wait until the session is over and then send the teacher the questions directly. And that will save him from that emotion of what you were seeing that he was having last year or she. Any other questions, Maggie, before we move forward? Not seeing anything yet, but I'll let you know if any more come in. Okay, great. So now we're gonna talk about study skills and why they're so essential. So having effective study skills impacts more than a student's ability to perform well on tests. Study skills affect your child's ability to manage deadlines and coursework effectively, staying organized, record and remembering information, and then to, to be able to read actively by questioning what is being read and relating it back to previously learned information. So what I always like to tell parents about study skills is those of you that I think there was one that had a third grader and an 11th grader. Um, so, you know, after a certain point, like your 11th grader, they're not getting study guides anymore. So pretty much after the sixth grade, students are, you know, out, they're not give teachers are not giving them study, study guides anymore. So they're creating their own. Well, in that, you have to be an active reader. You need to be able to record and remember information. and You need to understand what that important information is. So this is really where study skills are essential. And it's, it's important for younger kids too. You know, most of the time it might be a math test or a spelling test. And this is where recording and remembering information is extremely important for the younger kids. Effective study skills also help students manage test anxiety, which we know a lot of students have. It helps them use strategies while taking a test or an exam. It helps them to write well-written essays and reports and to produce and deliver presentations. Without these skills, students are not equipped to meet academic expectations they face each day. So let's talk about the areas of focus for study skills. So the first is effective executive functioning. Next is evidence-based study skills, test-taking strategies, and papers and presentations. So I broke these out into these four categories. And the first is areas of focus for, for studies with executive functioning. So executive functioning is essentially self-management. So the skills that are listed under executive fun functioning enable students to plan and set goals for them to be organized, remember instructions, and juggle multiple tasks successfully. One key component of executive functioning is organizational skills. Students must be able to create a work environment conducive to learning as well as have methods of organizing digital information. And digital, digital is key right now because with everything, well not everything, a lot of the schools being online, they were even before we, we you know, entered into COVID, they were using Google Classroom um, to manage their assignments. So, really understanding and organizing digital information is extremely important for them. Now, before we move forward, I know a lot of you have younger students. So how, how do you help a young student that isn't in junior high or high school with study skills? Organization is, is really big for young children. I highly recommend a planner. Your children, even if they have a Google Classroom and it's listed, your children need to be writing their assignments down when their tests are, so that way they have that in front of them and they can check them off. Just like a task list that we would have in Outlook or, you know, I'm, I'm pencil to paper and I write out a to-do list every day. Um, it's very important for them to be able to have that satisfaction of getting things done. And the more they do that, the more organized they will be. They still need to have folders for each subject. If you are printing their assignments off, which I highly recommend, they need to have folders to keep them organized. I prefer to color coat with things, but you know, 
whatever method works for your child that is, you know, organized and they know where their information is would be most beneficial for them for the younger students. So our, our next slide with executive fu functioning includes time management. Students with strong time management skills are able to create schedules, overcome procrastination, and balance their obligations. So again, um, I know a, a lot of parents struggle with their kids procrastinating. It was hard enough when they were in school and then having them come home and not wanna study or do their homework. So it's gonna be even harder because they're in the comfort of their own home. A lot of students like the online learning because you know, they can be in their pajamas all day if they want. Um, you know, I highly recommend, you know, just as we talked about that schedule before, they need to get up, they need to get dressed, they need to eat breakfast um, and create that schedule and make sure that they're sticking to that time commitment. And then obviously the balancing their obligations is getting their, getting their assignments completed and studying. The next slide focuses on uh, strategies to enhance their goal setting skills. So we do this by encouraging students to be active learners who take the initiative to reflect upon and apply what they are learning instead of passive learners who don't take control of their learning and don't go beyond what the instructor or teacher requests them to do. So we help students demonstrate drive, fortitude, and responsibility. Um, teaching students to use different methods of goal settings, including a personal action statement and learning contracts. Like, you know, in the beginning of the presentation, we talked about setting those goals. And the, the example we had was reading for 20 to 45 minutes a day, six days a week. You know, putting something down on paper and maybe there's a reward. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying anything big like a new iPhone or anything like that, but, you know, some kind of an award. You know, if they, if they do this for the short term period, then there's a, a, you know, a small reward that's attached to that. The next is empowering students to maximize their productivity. So help students to recognize what type of learner they are by providing study strategies geared towards their learning preferences. So typically, I would say 80% of students are visual learners. Some are not. Um, so if you are a visual learner, you are going to like, you know, graphs and charts and, and maps and pictures and things like that. Um, so you really want to understand what type of learner that they are. You know, some students do, do great with color coding flashcards and cataloging. Some hate flashcards or they love to use Quizlet, which is the electronic version of flashcards. Um, whatever that preference is and what type of learner they are, you want to gear those strategies towards their learning preferences. So anything that you can do to make learning easier for your child is the best strategy to use, as long as it's working and it's giving you results. Um, you want to you, you be able to adapt to different instructional styles. So, Teachers are usually uh, very good about this. You know, there's, I always say there's always more than one way to skin a cat. Um, if, they're not, if they're not learning the way that the instructor is teaching, that's when you have to talk to the teacher and say, I don't understand how, you know, how I'm learning this. Common Core is a good example of this. Many parents struggle with how math is taught for early, um, you know, basically K through six students. Um, teachers have really um, adapted to the fact that, you know, maybe some kids cannot pick up on Common Core, and if you talk to them, you know, there are other methods that can be taught as long as they're following those steps, so I highly encourage that. And then provide students with different methods for managing procrastination. So again, I'm going to stick to that schedule and your, your child, and I'm gonna use your an 11th grader as the example, he should have a daily schedule. It could, be on, it could be a Google Calendar. It doesn't have to be on a piece of paper, but he should be looking from the time he gets up until the time he goes to bed. He can schedule in his learning time, his exercise time, his eating time, his free time, 
you know, his sports, if he has a job or she has a job. But we do that with every student to show them, hey, you have a lot of time, you just don't realize it. Um, and when they see it on paper, it's a lot different than just saying, well, I didn't have time to do something. Well, let's see why you don't have the time to do it and let's put that down in a schedule. So that schedule is huge for managing procrastination and it really prevents the kids, if they know that they have something fun that they're looking forward to and they have to get their job done because school is their job, that's their work, um, it helps them in managing that procrastination. Now let's talk about evidence-based study skills. So the term evidence-based means that strategies have been proven effective through educational research or metrics of school, teacher, and student performance. So we break these into three areas, which are recording information, active listening, and enhancing memory. So in order for students to be able to record information effectively, they must also have different methods of recording information, including note taking, outlining, creating concept maps, diagrams, charts, and timelines. Again, depending on the type of learner your child is, maybe they're not a great note taker, but what if they are you know, what if they're one of those visual students that they can create a map or a diagram with that information and it gets them to the same ends. So there are multiple ways of doing this. Students need to be comfortable creating study guides out of these types of items. So again, after a certain point in school, study guides are not there. You know, the kids can't memorize them. And even in fifth and sixth grade, I have parents say, well, they studied the study guide, but they still got a C or a D on the test. And it's because they were memorizing the information versus learning it. So when the teacher gave them the study guide, they were giving that to them as a refresher of what they learned. And then the teacher poses the question in a different way, and the student has no idea how to answer the question. We want to make sure that they know the information. So if you are studying with your child, rephrase the questions and see if your child knows the answers. And next, so often students don't know how to create their own study guides other than rewriting notes. So students with strong study skills are able to use a variety of methods to create effective study guides that are far more efficient than copying information over and over again. So the methods include highlighting and marking to connect ideas and thoughts, creating questions and answers, creating outlines and making study cards, which are the same thing as flashcards. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this in, in, in further detail. So highlighting and, and marking to connect ideas and thoughts. So if your student has the ability to annotate, if they can, you know, obviously if, they, if, if it's a packet, then they can probably highlight it. But a lot of times, you know, it's, they can't write in their books or they're electronic. Um, so it makes it a little bit harder to do that. But if they have the opportunity, highlighting those clues to make those connections. So 80% of what you read is what is called filler information. 20% of, of the information presented is the critical information that a student will be tested on. And teaching them what those critical infor, information, teaching them the critical information of what they're tested on is what is important. So we use a method called SQ3R. So the first is to survey the information that you are going to be learning about. Looking at those topics, looking at those graphs and charts, and, and just understanding that information. So the S is for survey. The Q is for question. So it could be a topic. Will you turn that topic into a question on a piece of paper? And then you're gonna read that first paragraph and you're gonna see if you can answer that question. So when you're questioning, it's questioning, okay, you know, what is this going to be about or who is this going to be about or why is this important? 
So the five W's are huge when you're studying and you're reading information. And this is how you turn your children into being an active reader to what does this say? It's who, what, where, why, and when. Those are the questions that need to be answered when they are reading material, whether it is for English or science or social studies. That is what they will be tested on. So you wanna create questions based upon those five W's. And when you create outlines, it's the same thing. You're creating an outline based on the information that was presented. That is that critical piece of information. And you wanna keep those in sequential order. And then study cards are typically used for science and social studies, probably the top two outside of maybe vocabulary. Um, I recommend using color-coded flashcards. Um, you can, you know, I'm gonna use social studies as an example. If you were learning about World War II, you would have certain colors for dates, you would have certain colors for people, and you would have certain colors for events. You learn them by the color strategies first, and then you mix them to make sure that they have a full understanding. Any questions over that so far? Okay, then we'll move forward. In addition to gathering information from, from text, students must be able to actively listen. So this is extremely important for all of our children, strong listening skills. This means that students are able to isolate and record important information given in presentations, lectures, speeches, um, or just during regular classroom time. Most teachers will say, this is an important fact, or maybe, you know, uh, you know if they're, they're giving a lecture, they might say, one might note. Um, those are all listening clues that we need to use to make sure that we're documenting that important information. Successful students that are able to use verbal cues and nonverbal cues from their instructors to know when to record that information. So an, another set of verbal cues or an instructor might have is slowing down or pausing while speaking, repeating information, or speaking more loudly. And then nonverbal clues might be pointing or using hand gestures. The next set of evidence base is also imperative to students to be able to recall what they have learned and they're able to connect new information with previously learned material. To do this, students, they have to have ways to use text to remember key information. So teach memorization techniques such as mem memorics. So like we learned the alphabet, most of us probably through a song. We didn't learn it by looking at it and pronouncing each letter. We learned it through a song. So a song, I had one student that the only way he could actively read is if he sang it to himself. So there's a lot of students with a lot of special needs that are out there and you just have to figure out, you know, you could turn things into a rhyme or turn it into a story. There are a lot of different ways um, that you can use mnemonics to teach your children how to memorize information. And then also um, how to go back and revise or edit what they have learned to be able to retrieve thoughts and information faster. So when students first start taking notes, and you know, those of you that have older, older children in the household, you know that when they first started taking notes, they just wrote everything down. They would you know, read it and they would say, yep, that's important, that's important, that's important. And it would literally take them three hours to study for maybe a 20 minute test. Um, as, as they have developed and teachers have worked with them, they have learned those important keys and pieces of information. So you wanna be able to get them to those thoughts and information faster. So there's two simple strategies that we can give you to help your children at home. One is chunk reading assignments. And this is good for a student that has ADHD or ADD as well. So break reading into pieces or sections. Not only will this help maintain focus and concentration, it will allow your child to test 
whether or not he or she can rephrase what was read and reflect on signs that he or she does not understand the material. So chunking is extremely important. And then the other is putting things into their own words. When reading, your child should pause and paraphrase what was just read. If your child was reading historical texts, he or she should be able to retell the significant events or explain why an event was important. When studying math, um, he or she should be able to explain how to solve each word problem step by step. So if your child isn't able to do that, then he or she are likely does not have a full grasp of the material. So in moving forward, test taking strategies, and a lot of parents have a lot of questions on test taking strategies, which is a study skill. So it's important that students have developed skills so that they can tackle difficult assignments um, confidently and successfully. One of the ways students can develop their test taking skills is by gaining skills to prepare for the exam itself. So those skills are strategies to manage test anxiety and ways to rehearse for the test. So, you know, I know your students are going to be like, I'm not going to get up in front of the mirror and rehearse things. It's not necessarily like that. When we say rehearse is have them study and then have them come to you if needed and have you ask them questions and do that rehearsal with them. So students also need need that help um, when they're when they're sitting for an exam. So the skills include previewing the test to see what types of questions they need to answer. So if they're previewing a test, it makes it a little bit easier for them when they see you know a three page test. They're thinking, oh my gosh, this is insane. But previewing it kind of sets those nerves a, a little at ease because, you know, they can see which questions are worth the most points. This lets the student plan their time so they don't run out of time. Students with strong test taking skills are also able to hone in on key or qualifying words like all, none, or every to help answer tricky questions. And lastly, students must have effective ways to approach multiple choice questions, as well as open ended and essay questions. The biggest thing with multiple choice based questions that we teach every one of our students is to make sure you understand what the question is asking and you read all three, four or five answer choices, all of the answer choices. Test makers will always have two answer choices that are very similar. So if they're rushing, they will get to that first answer and say, yep, that's it. But they didn't read the fourth answer choice that fit the question better. So it's slowing down, reading your answer choices, and making sure that you're eliminating the answer choices that are incorrect. Because at some point, you're going to get to a multiple choice question, and you've read, let's just say it's a four for um, answer choice question, and maybe you'll get down to a 50-50. Well, 50-50 is better than a 25% at answering a question. So teaching them to read the answers, make sure that they're crossing out and eliminating the ones that are incorrect, and then answering based off of what they have left. And then let's take a moment to, to look at simple test taking strategy students can use before every test. So before the test, your child should remember the three S's. So supplies, your student should have proper supplies needed. It includes number two pencils or calculators and a watch to keep track of time. I know a watch seems kind of crazy, but if you, I know there's an 11th grade parent on here, um, you know, sitting for that ACT, you might not be next to the clock on the wall. You need to be able to look at a watch. And scribble. Your students should quickly scribble needed formulas or notes that may be forgotten. Not only will this prevent them from forgetting the information, but the student won't be preoccupied trying to remember these details and can focus on the test itself. So as soon as they come in, if it's a math test, write those formulas down immediately so they're not worried about forgetting them. And the last S stands for survey. Students should quickly look over the test before beginning to see how many questions there are. 
Are there multiple choice? Are they open-ended? Are some questions worth more than others? Are some questions easier than others? Obviously, we want to answer the easy ones and get those ones correct first and then spend our time working on harder questions. So students should use this information to formulate a plan of attack and that will alleviate a lot of that test anxiety. Any questions on test taking? Okay, so in summary, let's just recap some of the important points from the study skills portion of the presentation. So rereading is not an effective study strategy. We never want to have to continue to reread information. Multitasking negatively impacts the quality of completed work. So we want to make sure we're working on one task at a time. It's better to study in smaller blocks of time with breaks than to study for long periods of the time. Your brain needs a break. You need a drink. You need to walk around. You might need a snack. And taking notes on a computer um, can have advantages and disadvantages. Like I said, if they have the opportunity and they are able to write on material, that is the most effective way to do it. Some students don't. Um, but really, when taking notes and creating study guides, it should not be on a computer. It should be handwritten because you have more mental imprints that way. So for students to be successful, they must have tools to acquire, retrieve, and analyze and communicate information effectively. A personal action plan is a written tool used for goal setting to implement a particular strategy within a specific amount of time. Students can check for understanding by chunking their reading, creating webs, using guide questions, and paraphrasing the information that they've learned. Before starting a test, a student should make sure to have proper supplies, scribble information that they may forget, and survey the test to determ determine the number and types of questions, and then obviously answer the questions that they can immediately answer first. So how do we, we um, promote learning every day? So, Although the school year has introduced online learning, it's going to be important for you to promote an active learning environment during this time. So again, establish that daily routine as a family. Get a schedule together. Um, have your children reading, you know, for 20 to 45 minutes. Um, you know, after dinner and work, relax on your couch, read books or magazines. Watch documentaries. Um, you know, I don't know if any of you have, I always say, I always watch, you know, probably not the best TV. I should really watch more educational TV. And it's really great if you have children at home and, you know, there's so many different educational TV programs that are out there. They're about animals or certain documentaries about people, um, you know, and while you're watching them, you know, discuss during the documentary who, what, where, when, and why. Again, you know, with, with those five W's. Go on walks and talk, talk about positive things, you know, things, you know, get that social connection with your child because if they are doing 100% remote learning, they're not getting that from their friends. Um, you know, they really need, just like us, I feel like we were isolated for such a long time. It was so nice to be able to talk to people even with a mask on, um, you know, just to get that social interaction. And then, you know, talk about the future, you know, have that, you know, you want your child to be optimistic, you want to set goals together, um, you want, you want to see them be able to achieve those, you know, if you have a high school student, start talking about college, and, you know, maybe what professions, you know, they might really be interested in. And another thing is, is cooking. So I know this, this sounds kind of crazy, but we call it kitchen math cooking. So it's, and who doesn't love cooking? So, you know, when, when they're working, all baking is, is math. So, you know, you're using a fourth cup and a cup and two thirds cups. So you're working with a lot of fractions. So having them properly measure or, you know, tell you a fractional portion of amount 
Um, it's a great way to, de to develop a sense of accomplishment because then the cookies are baked and they get to eat them after they're done. And then, you know, playing games together, you know, have fun, um, you know, and you can do educational games. Um, you can create games out of certain subjects, especially science or building Legos. Um, you know, we know life is really challenging right now and it's, it's very different for your child. And I'm sure you have seen a, a lot of the, the social distancing affect your children. And these are just some effective ways to, to kind of promote that learning every day. And then the last slide that we have, um, which I know Maggie is gonna be sending this out to you. These are just different learning activities and resources that are out there that are available. Um, we would have, normally we would advise students to do things like visit museums during breaks. Um, but with the current environment, we know that that isn't, isn't possible. But these are just a few resources for your, for your kids that are free um, that, that may interest them. Any questions? Um, as we wait to see if any questions come in, I'll add um, that yes, I'll happily share these resources out with everyone who is here today. Um, we also have collected some um, great web resources on our website through the library that uh, have great websites and apps that um, help kids like engage a little more deeply on the internet and explore and learn um, as they navigate the web. Um, oh, I see one question coming in. What are good online resources for a first slash second grader? So, thank you, Raquel. So, Read, Write, Think is very good. Um, math is fun is very good. And then Scholastic Learn at Home is also very good. And those are on the list and uh, under the learning activities. And if you have a, if you have um, a high school student TED Ed is really good for, for high school. And then that Purdue Online Writing Lab is also very good. I recognize several of these from the resources we had compiled earlier this summer. Yep, these are some so great ones. Double vetted. Um, mm -hmm. Going to have some really great engaging content that'll speak to a wide variety of students um, with different interests. Because mm -hmm. like we were saying before, um, some of the best learning opportunities you can provide your children, students, um, are ones that like really speak to them and that interest them and get them excited to mm -hmm. be reading and learning and exploring. Um, Absolutely. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in just yet, so I'll take this opportunity to Thank you guys both so much, Stephanie and Raquel, for being here today from the Huntington Learning Center and sharing your um, expertise in this area with us. I really appreciate it. Um, we do have one more question that has come in for first graders. How to build computer skills to be able to actively participate in online learning? <laughs> Copying and pasting and typing. Yeah. I I, I wish that I had a magic button for you. Um, it's, it, this is very difficult and this is where it makes it very challenging for parents because, you know, not only do you have a bazillion other responsibilities, but, you know, a first grader is, is not meant to have the computer skills of, you know, a junior high student. Um, again, that's why I'm saying printing things off, if you have the ability to do that, would be the better option. And then, you know, if, the, I mean, I'm assuming they're going to allow you to scan things in and then scanning in their written work to the teacher. Um, I really don't have anything. There are typing apps that are out there, um, but I think they're well above a first grade level. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm not more help in this area other than printing off the information, having them do it by hand. And 
and sending it in. Yeah, Ella K, thank you. Typing.com is great. Yeah, I'm not sure. I know there's multiple apps that are out there for typing, but I wasn't sure if it was, you know, if it was grade appropriate or age appropriate for someone that young. Um, if you don't have a, access to a printer at home, um, also our library branches are open and um, we have made printing up to a certain amount free just to reduce touching in shared spaces. So if you have printing needs, please feel free to reach out to your local library branch. And even if you don't want to come in, a librarian will be willing to work with you to help you get the printouts that you need to make learning su successful at home. That's wonderful. It can also be an opportunity for a first grader. They're going to be exposed more to this. And at school, sometimes they do testing in computers. So in a way, they're going to work the UARA to higher level, and I'm sure a first grader teacher is not expecting them to type as much. So also talk to your teacher as well, and I'm sure they'll have plenty of tips and tricks for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. I do Just, also know that there are a lot of teachers, especially, you know, third grade and under, where they have you know, they have packets that are available. If you, like Maggie, what you were saying, if you don't have access to a printer, they can print you off a weekly packet of what the homework is going to be for the whole week. Um, so that would be something I would definitely reach out to the teacher. All right, and just one more comment. Thank you very much for the great presentation and responding to all our questions. Thank you for having us. We enjoyed um, presenting and, um, you know, I think this year is, is going to be a little trying, but like all things, I think we can, we can figure out how to get through this. Um, and, you know, the, the goal is to give our kids the best education possible by, you know, pretty much any means at this point. And, you know, the library there, Huntington is also here to help. Yeah. Absolutely.